and um, let me um, uh, encourage you if you're if you're here to if you didn't pick up a a um, a handout they're back there in the back it's three pages so front back and then a third page which has some um, some graphics on there to kind of help a little bit especially for those of you all at home uh, and then I'm also going to show some slides here too uh, along the way um, <clears throat> but tonight um, we have a lot that we're going to be covering uh, and as I was putting my final notes together, I realized that we're probably not gonna get through all of this lesson, uh, but that's okay. We'll, we'll just get as far as we can because I wanted to combine um, kind of two things. First of all, uh, the, um, the tabernacle proper, which in other words, the tabernacle proper is that tent area. We've already talked about the outer court but the tabernacle proper is that tent area. And hopefully when you came in, you saw the model there. Um, so uh, it's gone to the next level now. Now it's got all the little ropes and everything like that. Kind of gives you a little better of an idea as far as what it looks like. Uh, but then as we get through there and we talk about the tabernacle proper, uh, then Lord willing, we'll get into the place to where we'll start talking about the holy place. Now the holy place, is the first chamber, if you will, as you go into the tabernacle proper. There's two chambers. You have the holy place, and then you have the most holy place, which is called the Holy of Holies, which that'll be a whole separate lesson just in itself because there's so much that we want to cover through that. And so with that being said, um, let me kind of give us some of this basic review so far, kind of where we are. And in the meantime, you can turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 26, um, and there's a Bible there right in the front. If you need one right there on the thing um, in the front, it goes the books of the Bible is Genesis, then Exodus, uh, which is the, the second group of books. And so Exodus chapter 26, because that's going to be a main part of our, um, uh, of our uh, uh, text tonight. Um, but who would like to share, whether those online or here uh, uh, in the house, who would like to share kind of what we've learned so far? So in other words, what are some, some key little things that we have um, kind of ran across that, that you could explain? If you were to sit down and explain what the tabernacle is and what the Bible says about it and how it relates to Jesus, um, who, who could share just a few things? And if you don't know, make it up. <laughs> There's a bronze laver or all where they do the sacrifices at, I guess that's the altar, the bronze altar mm -hmm. where they do the sacrifices, which is the spilling of the blood as Jesus spilled his blood for our sins. Yes. Amen. So there, so there is this, there is this brazen, um, uh, uh, altar. And where is that located, Miss Deb? Do you remember? And just inside the gate, just the east gate. Come in, right. As soon as you come into the outer court, the very, very first thing that you're going to hit is this altar, is this brazen altar where they do all these sacrifices and so forth that God had given instructions. And then we tied that to it is clearly a picture of Christ and his sacrifice and so forth and what he did on the cross. All right, what else? Somebody else, George? Yeah, so notice George remembered that into, as you come into the outer court uh, and into the tabernacle area, there's only one entrance. And that again is just a picture itself of, of, of uh, there's only one way into the presence of the Lord. There's only one way to God and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we talked about that, good, what else? Yes. So Susanna is sharing that the tabernacle, of course, is, is a representation of the temple that's in heaven, that out of the book of Hebrews, it explains that uh, uh, is a model, if you will, um, of what that which is in heaven. And of course, ultimately, it all speaks of Christ. Somebody else. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, so uh, Angelica is sharing that uh, the level of detail that is given that God, so God didn't just say, hey, make a tent, put some ropes on it with some, with some, you know, with some material uh, and stuff like that and get you a big bowl and put water in it. God was very, very specifically detailed when he gave these instructions to Moses. And every single thing has a purpose, reason, and picture, and so forth. Well, those are good things. I'm glad you guys have caught some of the things. I'm going to review, uh, of course, um, uh, just kind of some high-level things. Um, and so the tabernacle, as, as a whole, as we've been learning along the way, illustrates four different things. And of course, this is, you know, you can read a lot of commentaries and there's a lot of different directions, but they're all pretty close. Uh, one of them is, is that it represents the heavens where God dwells and where he manifests himself. In other words, especially once we get into the Holy of Holies, um, uh, again, it's a representation, as we've already said, of that which is in heaven. As we've already said, it represents the work of Christ. Every single thing about this thing is a picture of Christ uh, uh, and so forth. It also represents the individual believer. In other words, as we've said, that just the process that you go, when you go into the tabernacle, when you first of all go into there, you, the first place of salvation is, is sacrifice for sins. It is, it is the cross of Jesus Christ. Then you go into, and then you hit the labor, which is cleansing. Uh, and then uh, once we get into the holy place, we've got the bread of life and the light of the world, all of that represented, and then the presence of God, which is kind of the process, and if you will, on our journey in our Christian walk. And then also it represents the church and all its variations and so forth. So we should notice how the plans for the tabernacle were revealed to Moses from the inside out. In other words, starting with the interior furniture and then working out. So in other words, if you'll notice, and I think I've said this before, but just a reminder, when God gives the instructions to Moses on what the tabernacle is, what he wants him to build and to convey to the people, from God's perspective, it starts from the Holy of Holies and goes out. But from man's perspective and the way that they did it was from outside in. Um, and so uh, God builds the sanctuary from the inside out, just as in us. The appearance um, of the heavenly dwelling place, which we're going to look at uh, that representation as far as the tabernacle itself, was not all that impress impressive from the outside. In other words, when we look at the coverings of this thing, it wasn't all that, it wasn't all that beautiful. It wasn't until you went on the inside is where all the beauty was. Um, the tent of meeting, which we're going to get even more specifically tonight, uh, in, in retrospect was small. It, it wasn't that big of an area, um, by, at least by the standards of some modern sanctuaries, which we would even have today. It was only around 45 feet long and about 15 feet wide. Uh, and it's, it's referred to, as we said, the tent of meeting, and that's the place that God Almighty was going to meet with the children of Israel, um, and uh, that gives us an idea of what we're talking about. So it was small by the standards, of course, to a modern church today, um, and so think about that. That's God condescending to the level of, level of man because it was his desire to be with man. Now, we know God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And so as a result of him, his omnipresence, it's not like that was the only place that he was. That's just what he told uh, Moses and the children of Israel. That's where I will meet you. That's where I will manifest my presence and so forth. And these are the things that I want you to do that. Um, and then they wander around with this thing. They're like nomads. They're just kind of wandering around uh, in, in the wilderness. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, show our um, PowerPoint here, and that should be up there. Perfect. So again, there is just kind of a, a, a little bit of a model of what we've seen up there. Again, we don't know 
really exactly what it looks like, but there's a lot of detail what we do know as to it. And so if you look on your handout um, on, the, uh, on the, the last page there, it gives you, you know, a little bit of an idea, again, similar to all these models and so uh, forth that you, that you see out there. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is turn in your Bibles to an, a, a Exodus chapter 26. Exodus chapter 26. So Genesis, Exodus chapter 26. And we're going to be walking through this. Of course, we're referring to a lot of these things back and forth uh, to get details. Um, but the first thing is on your outline um, is the coverings and the curtains for the tabernacle. The coverings and the curtains for the tabernacle. Um, and there were four sets uh, and there's another little picture there for you uh, to kind of see these, these coverings and so forth uh, that, that were on there. There were very specific layers that God had instructed Moses as they built this thing and as they uh, wandered out into the wilderness. And again, as we've already said, God has purpose and plan for everything that he does. And so again, it lends us to say, well, why didn't he just say build this thing and just put a big old leather thing over the top of it? Why all these various labor layers? And, and if, okay, if it wants to be thick, why didn't you just use a whole bunch of the same thing? No, everything had a purpose, plan, color, makeup, all these various different type things. And so there were four sets of curtains for the tent itself. That's your next fill in the blank there. Um, and uh, so there were four sets of curtains for the tent itself. The first one, this first layer, um, we find in verses one through six of Exodus chapter 26, and that is the fine linen curtain, the fine linen curtain. So in chapter 26 of Exodus, um, it says, this is God giving instruction, he says in verse one, moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of fine twined linen and purple and blue and purple and scarlet yarns. You shall make them with the cherubim skillfully worked into them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits and the breadth of each curtain four cubits and all the curtains shall be the same size. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain of the first set. Likewise, you shall make loops on the edge of the outermost curtain in the second set. And then 50 loops you shall make on the one curtain, and 50 loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is on the second set. And the loops shall be opposite one another, and you shall make 50 clasps of gold and couple the curtain one to another with the clasp so that the tabernacle may be a single whole. Okay, you're reading all that, and it's like, wait a minute, all these layers and all these things. Well, he's putting them together. So the layers, a lot of times, were multiple things that God had given instruction as to what they were due. These, um, these, Four sets of curtains are actually layers of covering for the tabernacle, and that is, of course, what covers the tent itself. So the first set, which is this fine woven linen, uh, linen had an artistic design of cherubim, all right? So when I say the word cherubim, what is a cherubim? It's, yeah, it's basically, it's an angelic being that's referred to in the Bible, uh, Satan was an angel, um, so not all cherubim are angels, so he was, a, he was a supreme angel, so he wouldn't have been considered a cherubim, I don't think. I may be wrong on that. I'll double check. That's your homework, all right? Um, so, uh, uh, but, so a cherubim is an angelic being, right? Because there are different 
types of angelic beings and so forth. You have some that are hover over the over the throne of God, and you know, then you have the archangel and all of those things um, and so forth. Muriel is fine. Don't worry about it. She's she's fine, guys. <laughs> we always have kids running around here, um, and so this was what was the first layer. So, in other words, you, you again, we, we it's kind of hard to see from that. You've got the, the model back there in the back, but this was the first layer that was laid over the top um, of it. And so you would have seen it definitely on the top. So now think about that. Um, it was visible only from the inside. And so on the inside of the tabernacle, one would see cherubim all around which would be kind of like heaven, right? Um, as one would see in heaven. Someone, if you will, please turn to Psalm chapter 80, verse one. Who will do that? Psalm chapter 80, verse one. Online or in the house. And once you get there, someone will just read it for me nice and loud. Psalm 80, verse 1. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. All right, so there's one reference there to God and who uh, has the cherubim around him. Um, let's, we can, well, I'll tell you what, I'll turn her, you can turn her if you want, Isaiah chapter 37 so in the book of isaiah chapter 37 we see from the word of god in verse 16 um it tells us that O lord of hosts god of israel then it says enthroned above the cherubim you are the god you alone of all the kingdom of the earth you have made heaven and earth ezekiel chapter 10 ezekiel And in verse uh, three, Ezekiel chapter 10, verse three, it tells us um, that uh, now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house when the man went in and a cloud filled the inner court. So here again, we have all these references to cherubim. Most of them are referenced the cherubim that are in heaven. So this first layer of this covering, God had given these specific instructions as to how it was to be designed. And again, that's a very perfect, specific reason, because that's what heaven would be like. Now, this fine linen curtain was made, as we just read, by sewing together five curtains, each one basically 42 feet long and six feet wide, first joined in a set of five and then joined together for a covering 42 feet by 60 by 60 feet. So it was this big, huge covering that had all, all these various layers within themselves. The sets of five curtains were not to be sewn to each other, but who remembers what we just read there in those sixes? How are they to be joined together? some rings right so they were basically like loops that would hold these things together on the fabric and gold clasps to link the loops from one set of five curtains to the other set of five curtains and then it says there in verse going back to exodus uh chapter 26 verse 6 it says so that the tabernacle may be a single whole so in other words it's all and of course that even has spiritual uh implications to it um, uh, the method of joining the curtains in unity and uh, 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 and diversity. So they were different, but they were all still one. Um, that, of course, the idea of being many, that we're all one in Christ, but we're individually members of one another. So they were separate, but they were one. Does that make sense? Um, so that's that first layer. The second layer we find in verses 7 through 13. So we got this first one. And then starting in verse seven, he gives further instruction. He says, you shall also make curtains of what kind of hair? 
goat hair. Oh, yummy. All right. For a, a tent over the tabernacle, 11 curtains shall you make. So this is goat hair with all these various level uh, 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 layers. Verse eight, the length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits and the breadth of each curtain, four cubits. The 11 curtains shall be the same size and you shall uh, couple five curtains uh, by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And the sixth curtain, you shall double over at the front of the tent. I mean, I think about the details here on how God wanted this to be able to be done. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is, uh, that is outermost in one set and 50 loops on the ledge of the curtain that is uh, out, uh, outermost in the, in the second set. Now, I, 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 I kind of teasingly say this because, I mean, obviously God gave Moses the remembrance uh, and the memory to be able to remember all of this. But I mean, this is a lot of detail that God's giving him on the mount that he's supposed to convey to those that are going to be making this verse 11. You shall make 50 clasps of bronze and put the clasps into the loops and couple the tent together that it may be here again, a single hole. And the part that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half uh, the curtain that remains shall be hung over the, over the back of the tabernacle and the length that remains in the length of the curtains, the cubit uh, on one side and the cubit on the other side shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it, all right? So this is that, that second layer, this goat's hair curtain is kind of your fill in the blank. Uh, goat's hair uh, produced a fabric that would have been dark and thick and coarse, kind of like probably more like felt like we have today, but much heavier as far as how it would have felt and looked. Um, this covering, as we just read, was made by joining together five and six strips of fabric with it, each strip being 45 feet long and six feet wide. And then the set of five strips and the set of six strips were joined together with a series of loops and bronze clasps. And then it says the remnant, the, the part that remains, it says shall hang over the back of the tabernacle since the goat's hair layer is six feet longer then the fine linen layer, the extra six feet, will cover the back portion of the tent. And then it says a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side. That's about three feet or so. Um, this layer would completely uh, uh, cover over the fine linen layer. So you had the fine linen layer that kind of went all down the sides, but this next layer was much larger and it covered all of that and would have been set out. That's why when you see on the model, there, uh, uh, it would have been, been, it wouldn't have just hung out and hung on the ground. It would have been tented over. Um, uh, this, uh, this, this fine linen layer, the heavenly set of coverings would be completely obscured and overlapped by the dark covering of goat's hair. And in other words, it wouldn't be transparent at all. It wouldn't be like you could go by and maybe look at the fabric and see what's on the inside. You couldn't, you could not see that inner curtain and God wanted to make sure and he had a reason for that and of course it's kind of again if if it's a picture of heaven and you know you not everybody has access to see what that would look like the next thing um is uh number three two sets of coverings which is the ram skin dyed red and the badger skin um uh, uh I'm sorry I'm moving to there we go there's the ram skin um uh dyed red and the badger skin back in verse uh as we look in verse 14 and it says and you shall make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skin and a covering of goat skins on top of that so this covering of ram skins would be like fine uh, leather, and we know later that it was dyed red. The outer covering of badger skins or perhaps could have been, uh, nobody really knows, they speculate on what badger is there or uh, uh, um, uh, different uh, types of animals and so forth. Some say it was a porpoise or a sea cow, uh, but it would have been very durable, very water resistant. Um, 
and it would have been like this outer uh, covering. And so you can see there, so where you've got this, this layer there that's red, uh, and then on top of that would have been this really thick thing that would have covered it all, more waterproof and so forth. What do you observe about, and I don't want to get too much ahead because I think you're probably already beginning to see what is, again, on the inner layer, that inner layer, what is it? It's fine linen and what kind of design? Okay, so it's got this, this cherubim design. All right, and then you had kind of a white, all right? And then on top of that, you would have had a red, and then you would have had this dark blackish thing. Yeah, so in other words, it's kind of like the outer layer is like the outside the world. It's a picture of sin. Uh, and then you have the blood, the red, which would represent the blood of Christ. Then you have white, which would have been, um, uh, which would have been um, purification and righteousness. Uh, and then, of course, the presence of God. So again, it lends itself. Why didn't God just say, hey, listen, put a bunch of fabric together. If you want to use some fancy stuff, you can. No, he gave very, very specific instructions as to which layer went where and which layer had specific covering and color and so forth. It's, it's, really, it's really incredible to think of the detail that God gave us here. Any, before I go any further, what, what questions or thoughts does anybody have? Naza, I know you probably have many. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. No, I'm glad you... Yes, no, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that, that you're here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, not in all cases. So the question that Suzanne is with, with the women there, uh, they did do some things, but the men, there was a lot of instructions for, for men that God had them do too. So I'm not sure about the specific curtain, if, if the women were responsible for that. I may be wrong. Um, again, that's your homework too. All right. But I do know that the men were involved in a lot of things. I know for the moving, I know that for like the, uh, the, 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 the things that like the, the, the candlestick and all those things were done by men that God had given some specific instruction. Good. All right. So let's go to letter B. Um, oh, by the, by the way, there's your badger skin layer. So there's your ram skin. There's the badger skin. So I kind of get an idea here of these various layers. First one, second one, third one, fourth one. All right. Um, so letter B is the framing system for the tabernacle, the frame itself, all right? Um, in verses 15 through 25, we have instructions as to the boards for the sides of the tent, all right? The boards for the sides of the tent. So if you look at this picture, if you're looking past that first row, because that's the outer uh, of the outer court, you look on the inside, what color does it look like there? I'm sorry? Okay, it's gold. All right. So let's look here in verses 15 through 25. Um, it says, you shall make upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Now that's that wood that we've seen used in a lot of places here, but in all of them, they were pretty much overlaid with material. Verse 16, 10 cubits shall be the length of a frame uh, and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame. There shall be two tenons on each frame for fitting together. So shall you do for all the frames of the tabernacle. You shall, verse 18, make the frames for the tabernacle, 20 frames for the south side. All right. So, all right, class, let me see if you remember this. All right, which way, which way was the door facing? North, south, east, or west? East. East, right? So you came in, that's the east gate. You come into the outer court. There's that first one. Then when you go into the tabernacle, the tent itself, you're still 
it's facing east. You're moving west, but it's on the east side. All right. So on the south. All right. So if this is east, where's south? Which direction? If this way is east, that way. Right. So there's south, which is the same side, of course, that the uh, the candlestick is. And we'll talk about that. So it's, it's kind of good to picture all of this because wherever they moved it, wherever they moved it, it would always face east with the outer gate facing east. As a matter of fact, I intentionally set our model up back there facing east. All right. Um, okay. Where am I? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay. So um, verse 17, there shall be two tenons on each frame for fitting together. So it should be due to the frames of the tabernacle. You shall make the frames of the tabernacle 20 frames for the south side and um, 40 bases of silver shall you make under the 20 frames. So the bottom of this thing would have been silver. Um, the two bases under one frame for its two tenons and two bases under the, under the next frame for its two tenons, verse 20. And for the second side of this tabernacle on the north side, 20 frames, and their 40 bases of silver, two bases under the one frame and two bases under the next frame. And for the rear of the tabernacle, westward, you shall make six frames and you shall make two frames for corners on the tabernacle in the rear, and they shall be separate uh, beneath, but joined at the top at the first ring. Thus it shall be with both of them and they shall form the two corners. Verse 25, and there shall be eight frames with their bases of silver, um, 16 bases, two bases under one frame and two bases under another frame. And you're reading that and going, I just can't picture this. What's a tenon and blah, 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 right? So that's why we have people that are a lot smarter than me to be able to do these models for these different type things. Okay, so right there, first of all, you kind of get a little bit of an idea of the base there that would have been silver, all right? That's what we just read uh, in verses 15 through 30, all right? <clears throat> so the boards for the sides of the tent, we just read that. Each board was to be made of acacia wood, and we know that they were overlaid with gold and each board would be about 15 feet high uh, and two feet, three inches wide, all right? So that's, you know, maybe about like that wide. These, these panels, basically, that would be go up. Um, the size of the most holy place itself, which we'll get to in a week or two, was 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits. It was a perfect cube. So this is all the outer part, um, which included the holy place and the most holy place, all right? Um, the north and south sides, as we just read of the tabernacle, would have 20 boards each, all right? So this side and this side. Here's the gate. Here's the opening into it. East side, south side, uh, west side. I'm sorry, north side, all right? It would have been the longest, the length of it this way, okay? Um, uh, the back or the west, westward side, okay? Because I'm going west. There would be six boards with two corner boards for a total of eight boards across the back, all right? Each board would be joined together by a system. We saw the word tenons. Uh, does anybody have uh, a study Bible that gives you what a tenon is? Okay, it's basically like a tab. It's like a tab that they would have these things and rings would go in there. As you can see there in the picture, um, it, it gives you a little bit of an idea where these rings were, these little tabs and um, through which the bars would run. They would run these bars uh, through there and the corner boards would have eight rings, four on two sides to accommodate the corners. And then it says each board would rest on 
two sockets of silver, one talent of silver for each socket. So each board rested on a base of something that weighed about 264 pounds of, of the silver. So it was very, very heavy on the bottom of that. So in other words, from a practical standpoint, you know, you needed something that was solid and, and this was. Um, of course, when we, we, take, we talk about silver, we talk a little bit about what that represents in the Bible. Um, who, who, could, who can remember what some of the stuff that silver represents? Or pictures of throughout the word of God? It was usually related to redemption. Redemption, silver would have been redemption. Uh, we saw that in Exodus and Leviticus, Exodus 21 and Leviticus 5, Numbers 18, Deuteronomy 22. And of course, we know that our Lord was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And so the tabernacle's foundation was silver. Of course, that in itself could even be re, uh, uh, pointing to the redeeming work of Christ. Um, and so uh, these, these, the gold, of course, when we see usually gold represented uh, in the word of God, usually it would depict what? Purity, heaven, right? All of those various different type of things. That's why the tabernacle proper underneath all this stuff was overlaid with gold. And when you got inside, it, it would have been just absolutely beautiful with all this gold and, and this, uh, this covering on the top that would have had the cherubim uh, uh, that, you would have, that you would have seen, all right? In verses 26 through 30, we have um, the bars to join together the boards. That's those little bars there. They go through those rings that you're seeing here on this picture. So look here in verse 26. It says, you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the frames of the one side on the tabernacle and five bars for the frames on the other side of the tabernacle and five bars for the frames on the side of the tabernacle at the rear westward, verse 28, the middle bar halfway up the frames shall run from end to end. All right. So you got five. So you got this, this middle one, then two on top, two on the bottom. Um, you shall overlay the frames with gold and you shall make their rings of gold for holders for the bars and you shall overlay the bars with gold and then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for that was shown on the mountain so that's what all of 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 all of this material that would have been made uh, now uh gold heavy or light it's heavy all right um if you went to fort knox which we really don't even know if there's any there anymore probably not they're on guard and something but it's probably something else who knows but a big gold a, a bar of gold like 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 that you picture like at fort knox um is incredibly heavy all right but it's also very very soft pure gold right? In fact, the people who work uh, at, at uh, places to where they have gold, uh, they inspect your fingernails before you leave work. Why? You could scrape off the gold, right? Get, you know, have your grill gold, right? You know, you know how some people, their grill is gold. All right. Um, so uh, these bars, each bar was, as we just saw, made of the same wood overlaid in gold and um and seemingly they ran the entire length of each side linked together each board into one system so again stability um four bars would run horizontally on each side linking each board and one would be visible running in the middle of each board um and then he says according to the pattern in which you were shown on the mountain speaking of moses uh, that repetition of phrases over and over again, because God says, hey, I'm just exactly like I said. Um, and so he would have had some type of vision on what that would have looked like. So that's 
the framing system for the tabernacle. The next thing, letter C on your outline, is two barriers, which are the veil and the screen. The veil and the screen. And we see, um, again, a picture here. Uh, again, as best as a rendering so anybody could do. You have the one veil or the screen that would go into that first thing. So if you're facing it as we're looking at it here, when you go into, that would be that screen and it would go into the holy place. And in the holy place, it was twice the length of the most holy, that second chamber, all right? So if the, if the holy place was 10 cubits by 10 cubits, and the holy place, the most holy place was 10 by 10. And if the holy place was twice the length of that, that makes the holy place how many cubits long? It was 20 cubits long. So that's why when you look at here, you see that first chamber there, that holy place inside of that was the lantern and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. Um, that second part is the veil. That's the veil that you went into the most holy place. All right. So that's what we're talking about. So there were two barriers. The veil we find in verses 31 through 33. It says, and you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined lin linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang, uh, hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall bring the veil Oh, uh, uh, well, we'll keep reading. And you, sh uh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Go back up to verse 26. Is that where I was? No, I, I started in verse 31. Sorry. Start again in verse 36. Pay no attention to the bald man. Um, oh, no, no, no. I was right. Yeah. Verse 31 through 33. All right, yes, yeah. so, and you shall bring the veil, verse 33, and you shall bring, hang the veil from the class and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil, uh, and the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. So we're talking about that big veil, as you see there in the back, um, and uh, it was very, very thick, all right, and that separated the holy place uh, from the other. So I told you backwards. In other words, I forgot that God, when he gives the instructions, is the other way out. So this veil was made of fine linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarn. And it had this artistic design as cherubim again. Uh, and it was to hang on four pillars made of acacia wood, again, overlaid with gold. And they were set on silver sockets themselves. Um, we do know that later, when the temple was made uh, in Jerusalem, hundreds of years later, which is much, much larger, of course, than this, where the temple was, the veil itself that was made for this big, huge temple, Solomon making the first one, the last one being whose, whose, whose temple was destroyed in 70 AD? Herod. Yeah, Herod's the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So who are you saying? No, no, I'm in 70 AD. In other words, that's Jesus' time. Yeah, Herod's temple. So you had Solomon who made one, and then it was destroyed, and then they then you had them rebuilding Zerubbabel and blah, 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 blah. But the final, the last one that existed before it was destroyed was Herod's temple. All right. And in Herod's temple, um, there the the veil. This thing that we're just talking about was huge, of course, because it, it, it was in the thing, and it was thicker than a man's arm, all right? What do we know based on the word of God significantly happened to that veil when, um, when Jesus was crucified and he died? It was, totally yeah. top it to was ran in two from the top to the bottom, all right? So that's, that's that veil, but this is a smaller version. Um, and so... Um, 
and it would have had Sherbin on it also. They would have tried to depict it as best as they can. All right. But it would have been a much, much larger version. The other aspect is too, is that this one was thick. The other one was thick. Why would it need to be so thick? <laughs> to keep God in. No, I don't think so. All right. But in other words, what, why? Say it again. It, well, yeah. In other words, you, you, you're not, you, you can't see through it. You're not supposed to see through it. All right. It was very, very thick. You were not supposed, only one person could go into the most holy place. And that was the high priest. So you couldn't, you couldn't see, uh, you weren't supposed to see through them. I made a mistake. I didn't realize that there are, I mean, I guess I realized it, but I didn't realize you could, you could find it by looking on a tag, but curtains on the thickness of the curtains. Do you guys know that? So in other words, I would just go, that's too thin. That's too thin. But no, in other words, they have various levels of curtain thicknesses. So when you go and buy curtains, you can find there's one that's called like opaque or something. What that's basically, you can't see through it. No sunlight comes in or whatever, which is what in Florida is what we need, right? When you, when you close those curtains, if you still have, if you have the real cheap thin ones, the light's still coming through. And I made that mistake of getting it. So put that in your hat. There is some trivia there for, if you didn't know, um, there are, you can look on the label of curtains and it tells you the thickness. There you go. Um, but it, this would have been very, very thick. And it was to have this artistic design of these cherubim. Um, and so therefore the interior walls and ceiling of the tabernacle would um, be either gold or pictures of cherubim. All right. So you would have gold on the walls. You would look up the cherubim there on the veil on the inside would have also been cherubim. A, again, a beautiful picture of, of heaven. Um, and it says that the veil was to be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. And so the tent was separated as you can see from the picture here, by the veil into these two compartments, the holy place, which was the larger room where you first entered, had the table of showbread, the lamp stand, and the altar of incense. And then, of course, the most holy place, which was the smaller room with the Ark of the Covenant in there. And the veil was a barrier. And as I've already said, no priest could go beyond the veil into the most holy place except the high priest. And he only went in once a year on the Day of Atonement. Um, the Bible tells us when he went into there, um, uh, 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 Jesus, we, we know from Hebrews chapter nine, with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption through that. And so um, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves when we get into the holy place. But again, it's all this beautiful picture of that. Um, it was interesting. I found this historical note, too, that Centuries later, um, uh, in uh, uh, the ancient general uh, Pompey, not to be uh, confused with the place Pompey, pushed aside the priest. Now, we're not talking about the big temple, we're talking about the tabernacle, and walked right into the most holy place of the temple. And he was astounded to see that there was no idol or statue. Now, he would have expected that because that would have been what the pagans would have done. You go in there, would have been this statue or some type of idol or something in there. So just a little side note. The next thing in verses 34 and 35 is the arrangement of the furniture in the two rooms of the tabernacle. Um, and so you can see here from the picture, let's look here in verse 34 and 35. It says, and you shall put um, the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony of the most holy place. So in other words, when you think of the ark of the covenant, it's really two pieces. You've got the ark, but the cover was called the mercy seat. And that's the cover that had on there. And it had two cherubims over also on the top. And if you remember from Indiana Jones, right? When he went in there, you know, it's probably similar to what that looked like, all right? Um, and then so uh, you shall make, uh, let's go back to, 
you, the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, verse 35, and you shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table, and you shall put um, the table on the north side, all right? So we just walked from on the inside going now into the holy place out of the holy of holies so the ark of the covenant here called the ark of the testimony would be behind the veil in the most holy place that's the only thing that was in there that was it um the table of showbread which we'll get into in a moment uh would be on the north side all right so if that's west where's north that way right so if that's west this would be the north side so that would be the table of showbread all right and then the lampstand would be on the south side which would be over here and so i like to keep reminding us of all of that because if you're ever in another place to where you're trying to help somebody explaining to them the tabernacle of god when you can picture all of this stuff and you're going in there in your head it's so much easier as you're explaining uh, the tabernacle and what it all signifies and so forth. Um, the table of showbread over here, the lampstand on the south, and the furniture in the holy place, um, of course, speaks of three great things that we must do. Because also in there was this altar of incense. If you look at there, and we'll, we'll, we're going to have placement for that in just a moment, but if you look there, that little thing that would have been there in the center, that would have been the altar of incense. So the altar of incense, as we'll see, represents the prayers that are going up to God. You have over um, the altar, we have fellowship with Christ, which is the table of showbread. And then we have uh, the illumination from God's word over on the lampstand and we'll, we'll we'll get more detail but again all of these things have significance then in verse 36 and 37 now we go outside so i had it backwards just a moment now we're talking about the screen that screen um oops let me go back over here hold please would have been this outer one there the first one that you would have gone in there. And we have that in verse 36 and verse 37. It says, and you shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, linen embroidered with needlework. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia and overlay them with what? With gold. Their hooks shall be of gold and you shall cast five bases of bronze for them so when you went into the most holy place the bases were silver when you went into or the holy of holies when you went into the holy place that first chamber first going in this time it was bronze again so um that screen uh it's pretty much the same color scheme as we had with the veil blue and purple and scarlet and fine line thread uh fine linen thread as used to make a covering for the east entrance of the tabernacle, which would have been the only way to be able to enter. So just like the east side was the only way to enter into the outer court, the east side was the only way that you could enter into the holy place. That was where this screen was, and you would go through there because what was on the sides in the back? What was on the sides in the back? You're, you're, you're going at it, Catherine. The boards, right? Overlaid with gold, right? So you can't go there. The only way would be through this screen from, from the east side. So there's no, there was no even sneaking in if you wanted to be able to do that. Um, and so the screen would hang from hooks on five pillars. Each pillar made of this acacia wood overlaid with gold on this foundation of bronze. Um, as we've already said, it would be made with uh, uh, purity and endurance through trial uh, and so forth. Lots of pictures there. Um, and so just a few additional thoughts, and then 
we'll break down a little bit more into the holy place on the more details of the table of showbread uh, and the other. Um, as I've already said, the people themselves never saw what the interior of the tabernacle looked like. Now, as a matter of fact, even when they were moving it, it was covered. So only the priests were the only ones that were able to see what it looked like. Um, the only way the people knew what the tabernacle looked like was from what eventually what Moses had written for them to be able to read from the word of God. Um, so their knowledge is not by sight, but it's by the word of God. Um, they are all, uh, they are, so in other words, it wasn't a mystery, right? In other words, God let them know what it looked like, uh, but it was through illumination through the word of God, other than those that were chosen specifically to do it. Um, they are told about what's inside the tabernacle. They know uh, every stitch of it. Nothing is to be done in the tabernacle except what God has revealed in his word, but none of them see it with their own eyes. Um, and then, of course, Jesus himself, through his finished work, removes the veil of separation and is now us for as a high priest, his the sacrifice of the tabernacle. Um, and so uh, the tabernacle, uh, now, now follow along here with me because I'm going to kind of set you up. All right. It would have been very, very dark. You have all these layers. You have all these various different type things. The only light that we can gain from what is told us would have been where on the inside? In the holy place. And what would have given its light in the holy place? The lampstand. All right. So if you, you have to light the lampstand to be able to even have light in there because you, you walk in, the veil's closed and all these, these different types of coverings. And so the, the, um, um, there was no light that we know of in the Holy of Holies. I'm going to set you up though. The Holy of Holies would have been pitch dark. And that's where the high priest went in. Um, year round, uh, there was a light provided uh, um, by the sevenfold lampstand in the outer tabernacle, but not the Holy of Holies, just darkness. So here's the setup. What would happen in the Holy of Holies, for those of you all that already know, in the most holy place, where it would have been a perfect cube, the only thing that was in there was the Ark of the Covenant. What took place in there? God met him there. Okay. God met the high priest in there. And the Bible, as we'll see later, once we get into the holy place, met, manifested himself between the two cherubim. And that would have been when he would have sprinkled the blood, all right, at the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, and he would have sprinkled the blood and the glory of the Lord would have shown up. And every reference that we have of the glory of the Lord is light. It's called the Shekinah glory of, of the Lord. And so most people, which I would make sense to me, uh, that are scholars of all of this, would say that would have been the light that you went in there. When, when the high priest went in there and he's meeting in the presence of the holy God, who is really omnipresent, but that's the where he says, this is where I'll meet with you. All right. The Shekinah glory of the Lord probably was the light. Let's very quickly turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And, um, Look in verse 23. Now, this is speaking of uh, the new heavens, all right? The new Jerusalem, if you will. I'm sorry, the new Jerusalem. 
And it says, and the city, verse 23 of Revelation 21, has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for what? The glory of the Lord gives its light and its lamp is the lamb who is Christ himself. If you look in verse 25, it says, and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. If you look in verse chapter 22, verse five, it says, and night will be no more. There will be no not light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they shall reign forever and ever. So most likely, because otherwise the, the high priest is just kind of all in the complete dark, just kind of going around in there. All right. And, and he would have had these responsibilities that we do. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Susanna's pointing out that when Moses was on the Mount and spent all that time with God, God was in his presence, Lord, just as she kind of glory, because he would have been destroyed if, if God in his fullness had been there. And just to glimpse him, because he, he says, I'm going to pass by you. Moses says, can I see you? And God says, you can, or you'll die. He says, I'll let you see my hinder parts. And so what did he do with Moses? Where did he put him? In the cleft of the rock. He put him in there. And when God passed by, he put his hand there, his hand, right? And um, he saw the, the latter part and saw the glory of the Lord, just the, the Shekinah, just the lap, just a little bit of it. And when he came down out of the mountain, the Bible tells us his face was glowing. And the people were like, dude, that's just like weird, please. Put a veil over your face because it was freaking them out. All right. Just that little glimpse of the glory of the Lord. It makes you wonder if the high priest, maybe when they came out, maybe shined a little bit. Don't know if that's what, what happened. So just interesting thought there. Okay. All right. So now let's move on to the holy place. All right. Let me see uh, if you will enable me to see if I can find uh, that. All right, I'm gonna go there. Apologize for not having it ready for you. Have not study and the holy place. There we go. All right, and um, let's share the screen. There we go. Share, play. All right. Oh, oh, that's the holy of holies. Dog on it. Hang on. Well, I don't, I thought I had, oh, hang on. Okay, I don't, I, th I thought I had PowerPoint for that, so forgive me. All right, so let's go into the holy place, which is found in Exodus chapter 25. starting in verse 23. Again, the holy place, here's my bald head, um, was that first chamber, and that's where the table of showbread, the uh, uh, altar of incense, and the, uh, the lantern would have been. Uh, starts is described here in Exodus 25, looking at verse 23. Um, it says, you shall make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with what? Pure gold. All right, here we have that. It's pure gold again. And make a molding of gold around it. 
and you shall make a rim around it, uh, a hand breadth wide, and a molding of gold around the rim, and you shall make uh, and you shall make it for four rings of gold and fasten the rings to the four corners of its four legs. Close to the frame, the rings shall lie as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and the table shall be carried with these and you shall make its plates and dishes for incense and its flagons and bowls uh, with which to pour drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold. And you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me regularly. So we'll get into that, what that's all about. Verse 31, here we have the golden lampstand. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work, its base, its stem, its cups, its uh, calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches going out of its sides three branches of the lampstand out of the one side of it and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups uh, made like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and a flower on one branch and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and a uh, calyx and flower on the, on the other branch. And so with the six branches going out of the lampstand. So you, you've seen a menorah, well, this isn't a menorah, all right? This is, a menorah looks similar to it, but a menorah has how many? Seven, eight, right? Seven, eight can have eight, seven, seven, eight, seven, right? Three, three, and one in the middle, all right? So it's seven, all right? And so, uh, so you have that, all right? So, but this would have been just six, but would have been the same way based on the description, all right? Gold had these beautiful, uh, hammered out works and so forth along there. Um, and then verse 34, and on the lampstand, it shall be four cups made like almond blossoms, all right? So it look like these pretty flowered things and they're calyxes and flowers. Um, verse 36, and the calyxes and the branches shall be one piece with it, the whole of it a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. And you shall make seven lamps for it. And the, uh, uh, and the lamp shall be set up as to give light on the place in front of it. Its tongs and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made with all these utensils out of talent of pure gold, and you shall uh, make them after the pattern for them, which is shown you on the mountain. Now, when I went to Jerusalem, um, there in Israel, I went to a place called the Temple Institute. I've told you a lot of times about that. And they are basically have made a depiction and ready for this. They're hoping of course, you have the Mosque of Omar, and you have the Dome of the Rock there now, right on the Temple Mount. Well, there's a hope someday that they'd be able to rebuild the temple. And if that were the case, they would have to have ready this, all these things, right? Table of showbread. And I saw it. It's ready. It's gold. They would not let me walk out with it. I tried. So anyway, couldn't have got it on the plane. So as we go into the tent as we've already seen there was a very beautiful chamber and this first chamber as you walked in was 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide the ceiling above the walls and the veil before the most holy place are all aglow with blue and purple and scarlet and these bright cherubim um, on the north side stands the table of showbread left side the lamp and ahead to the west is the golden altar. Uh, we're now in the holy place. You also should have a reference there to Exodus chapter 30, verse 1 through 10. Kind of gives more description there, what's in there. Um, outside, uh, everything, who remembers the, the articles of furniture outside of the tent? What were they made of? Bronze, right? So you had the altar, and then you had the labor. Now, the labor was polished, as we saw, but it's all made of different material, all right? Um, and then uh, the standards that held up the curtains of the court, the altar, the labor, everything on the outside, the columns of the gate, everything was of brass, which is a type of picture, of course, as we talked about uh, the judgment of God upon sin. The outside, of course, represents, has to do with our sins at the altar at the cross, um, the labor for cleansing, 
Uh, but on the inside of the sanctuary, when you went into this first place, there is altogether different material and an altogether different material. Everything is made out of gold, uh, either solid, beaten, pure gold, or overlaid with gold. Every furnishing, every instrument is made of gold. We are now in the presence of where God would meet, not in the Holy of Holies, but in other words, we're in this representation of heaven. Now, the people, when they came into the outer court, when they would bring their sacrifices, could see all the stuff on the outside, but they never got to see what was on the inside. Um, so we have now uh, letter A on your outline, instructions for building the table of showbread. We just saw, as we read there in verses 23 through 29, the dimensions and materials for the table of showbread. This table was to be made, what was the inner material again? Acacia wood, overlaid with gold. It would have been about three feet long, uh, three, about three by three feet, one inch-ish, six inches wide, and about two feet, three inches high. So it wasn't like this big, huge table. It wasn't that big. So picture a yardstick, right? It was about, it was about that length. Wasn't very high and so forth. Um, this table was also to have the rings and poles on it. Why would you have these rings and these poles? So you could carry it, right? It's overlaid with gold, man. Would have been heavy. Um, and so also, as well as the dishes and the pans and so forth, that would have also been made out of pure gold. And that's referenced also in Exodus. Um, that's the dimensions and material for the table of showbread. Now, what's its purpose? Well, let's go back to verse 30. It says, um, uh, where were we? We were in Exodus 25, verse 30. It tells us that, and you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me regularly. On the table of showbread, was to be 12 loaves of showbread. It was another reference to that was also called the bread of faces. Showbread, bread of faces. Um, the bread associated with it was to be eaten before the, like the face of God. Now thinking about that. So if you are the priest who would have the permission to be able to do this, um, would have been eating it when it was allowed at specific times in the presence of God. Well, that's, what was that, what would that represent? Fellowship, right? Just having fellowship with God. I mean, think about it. Now, granted, when we are with friends and family, uh, especially when you're with, like, for a specific time, I mean, you know, sometimes we eat just out of necessity, but why do we eat together? Of course, it's fun eating. Amen. Right. Jared knows. He knows me. So there's definitely fun eating, but there's also why do we eat together? For fellowship, right? In fact, in most Middle Eastern cultures, the meal around with family, right, is, is, is very precious. I mean, it is, it is that time. It's, it is like you're, you're reaching out. When you're invited to have a meal with someone, you're invited for fellowship, right? And so um, uh, it, it, it was made according to Leviticus chapter 24, verses 5 through 9 made of fine unleavened flour. Uh, it was called the showbread also, as I said, bread of faces or presents bread. Um, and uh, it was made of this fine flour. And how many, how many were stacks were there? How many? And a total of how many? 12. What do you think the 12 represents? 
the 12 tribes, right? All of them would have represented. Um, and there would have been these 12 cakes of showbread, one for each of the tribe of Israel, um, would stand on the, on the table. Uh, and then it says it was sprinkled with frankincense. Now, when you hear frankincense, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I'm do what? <laughs> what else comes to mind? <laughs> right. Yeah, it was a gift that was to Jesus. But what is frankincense? It's a spice, right? And so it's a very aroma, very, very, very strong smelling. And it was sprinkled with that. Now, I don't know. Has anybody here ever tasted frankincense? You have? What'd you think, sis? You did? You, what did you have frankincense on? That, oh, there, oh God, now I'm connecting the dots. That's awesome. So what's it taste like? It's, it's bitter, right? It's in a drink. It's kind of spicy, right? That's what I understand. I haven't tried it, all right? But anyway, it was sprinkled on, on top. So it would have given an aroma. And for whatever reason, the assumption is that it would have given a little bit of taste, you know, or something like that. Um, and once a week, the, the bread would be replaced and only priests could eat of that bread, according to Leviticus chapter 24, verse 5 through 9. Um, and all thank offerings were holy, and, and this one in particular. So number three there, what were the offerings that were offered or offerings presented? Only the showbread, the incense offerings, which we'll, we'll look at later, and the wine for libation or the drink offering were presented in the holy place. Those were the only things in the holy place that were presented. All other offerings were brought where? To the outside, to the brazen altar, right? Um, out in the court. And not all those specifically said that the wine stood on the table, it's evident that the bowls were intended for most likely for holding and pouring out wine. Um, if you'll turn very quickly to Numbers chapter 4, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Oh, wow. I'm like, okay, guys, look behind you. What's that clock say? I have plenty of time. <laughs> it's eight o'clock already. My goodness. All right, we'll stop here, but turn very quickly to Numbers chapter four. I was like, man, that clock's not moving. So you guys online wondering, of course, it's about our normal time anyway. It's a good thing I looked at my clock because they got to just start throwing stuff at me. So Numbers, uh, Leviticus chapter uh, four. I'm sorry, Numbers chapter four, and look in verse seven. Now, you probably have in chapter four of Numbers a, a heading there that says something about the Kohathites, right? Or the duties of the Kohathites. They were part of the Levitical family. They were a, a clan, if you will. They had specifically that part were responsible for moving the parts of the tabernacle when God would move them around. Now look here uh, in verse seven, it says, and over the table of the bread of the presence, they shall spread a cloth of blue and put on it the plates, the dishes for the incense, the bowls and the flagons for the drink offering the regular showbread also shall be on it. So that's how they moved it. And again, this was that only that other place, if you remember a few weeks ago, I mentioned was the only thing that was covered with that blue. So kind of interesting there. All right. Okay, we'll stop there. I'll put a little note. Um, next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about a little bit more about the significance of the showbread. Uh, and um, there's a lot of stuff there. Then we'll get into the lamp stand and a whole lot of other things. All right, a lot of stuff. Um, I encourage you to go back, look in the Bible, look at what God has to say about all of these things. Look at the cross references to a lot of these things 
and it kind of helps to connect all the dots. Uh, we still have a lot to cover. Let's close in prayer and um, we'll let you go. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your grace, your goodness in our lives. Lord, I thank you for uh, your word. I thank you for um, uh, what we have in it and showing with us, Lord, this beautiful picture out of the Old Testament on what all this means and God, how we can connect the dots to how it all points to you. And so, Lord, may we um, just be amazed at this great and mighty, incredible God that we serve. Lord, bless our evening now. Lord, we'll look forward to seeing what you're going to do when we gather together again uh, this Sunday. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you all. God bless you. Love you all. We'll catch you later.